afternoon, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, so close to uh, holiday break for many, I know, so we're grateful to have you here with us. My name is Maya Berry, and I'm the Executive Director of the Arab American Institute, based here in Washington, D.C. Um, conversation today is focused on um, a brand new poll, first time being released here uh, domestically, uh, called Today's Middle East, Pressures and Challenges. It surveyed regional attitudes on the emergence of ISIS, the role of the Muslim Brotherhood, the growth of sectarianism, the future of Syria and Iraq and Iran, uh, future of Syria and Iraq and Iran's nuclear program, in addition to many other issues, which we'll get to today. The poll was conducted in November of 2014 by Zagbe Research Services for the Sir Ben Yas Forum, an annual event co-hosted by the UAE Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Washington-based Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, it surveyed over 7,500 uh, adults across eight era countries. Uh, we're going to start today with a presentation by Dr. Jim Zogby, who is the president of the Arab American Institute, uh, which he founded in 1985, and the director of Zogby Research Services, a firm engaged in groundbreaking public opinion research uh, um, across the Arab world. In uh, September of 2013, he was appointed by President Barack Obama to the U.S. Commission for International Religious Freedom, uh, a nine-member independent bipartisan federal government commission that monitors the universal right to freedom of religion or, or a brief a belief abroad. He also writes a weekly column that since 1992 has appeared in newspapers in 14 Arab and South Asian countries. He's the author of a number of books on Arab public opinion and his latest being um, Arab Voices, What They Are Saying to Us and Why It Matters. So we're going to have Jim come up and uh, make the presentation of the findings uh, and then we have the privilege of having two guests with us for a conversation uh, and including your questions and comments. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jim Zogby. Thank you, and uh, I want to echo what Maya said. It's uh, delightful to have you come out uh, this uh, on this close to the holidays uh, to hear the poll report. I want to I want to just begin by noting that usually when I do these poll reports, there's a simple narrative line that runs through them. There is no narrative line that runs through this because we were polling uh, uh, John Alterman, who will be one of the commentators uh, today, um, was representing CSIS at the. Sir Banias Forum in the UAE that the polls were done for. And uh, there were a series of panels on a number of issues relating to contemporary pressures facing the Arab world. Uh, these questions were designed to meet the needs of those panels. And so there's a whole range of issues that we cover. And I'm going to hope that you're going to be able to follow it. I think there's some real gems in here that you're going to find uh, interesting to, to work with. Um, and uh, let's just let's just get going. When the Arab world first experienced what came to be called the Arab Spring in 2011, we did a poll. You have that. It was available, made to you out there. Uh, and there was a tremendous sense of hope. A um, little bit of expectation and tentativeness, a sense that it, a little too early to tell. We're not quite sure where this is going. But overall, there was a sense of optimism. We have the poll here, uh, results from 2011 and 2014. Um, look at the red lines, which are the, the worse off. Is the Arab world better off or worse off since the Arab Spring began? In 2011, um, the, the worse off, the red, was very small in, in most of the countries. Um, look at how it grew in 2014 um, in Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, um, in Saudi Arabia. It grew four times uh, from a 9 or 10 percent in Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia in 2011 to almost a 40 percent um, at this point. Where's the clicker? I don't have the clicker to go. There. There. <laughs> Want to go to the next slide, um, which now asks the question, um, the impact of Arab Spring on your country. Um, and in some of the countries, of course, there was no impact. Um, but, and the yellow is therefore not, it says too early, it actually ought to be saying no impact. But look at the Egypt, which I think is the really interesting number here. Better off, worse off in 2011, significantly better off. Uh, very few said worse off, and many rightly judged too early to tell. But by the time you get to 2014, when the poll was done, 30% say better off, 29% say worse off, and 29% say too early to tell. 
the result of the, the, the last three years, the impact of the last three years on Egypt have created a real tentativeness in a sense that we're not quite sure this is working for us. Um, we then had a series of questions about the Muslim Brotherhood and its role uh, because it emerged uh, as a significant player in the Arab Spring. And so the question was, uh, first, what is the role of the Muslim Brotherhood in your country? Um, only Turkey has a favorable uh, rating for the Muslim Brotherhood in, in their country. Uh, in every other country, it's, uh, it's negative except for Egypt. And that, I think, again, is a fascinating number to look at. 43% of Egyptians said um, that it had a positive impact. 44% said a negative impact. Um, and that runs contrary to the narrative that is currently being uh, um, uh, directed, I think, both at an Egyptian audience, but also at the, at the rest of the world, that the Muslim Brotherhood has been rejected. He, here's the issue. When we polled in 2013, in May of 2013, the Muslim Brotherhood had a 22% favorable rating in Egypt. When we polled again after Tamarud in June 30th, their rating had gone up to 28%. By September, it was in the mid-30s. And today, it's almost even. And so there seems to be a, uh, um, a, uh, a negative impact, I guess is the, the, the simplest way I can put it, uh, to all of the, the effort to delegitimize them. Uh, something I think worth thinking about. We asked in Egypt, it's 43, 44. We asked in the rest of the Arab world how they judged the role of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Um, again, I find interesting. I, I expect the Turkey numbers to be where they are. I was surprised at the Saudi Arabia numbers. 52% of Saudis saying they thought the Muslim Brotherhood had a positive role um, in, in, in Egypt. Um, and now we go to a whole series of questions about Syria. Um, we asked about all of the quest of countries that had experienced the Arab Spring. We asked about Yemen and Libya and Syria. We also asked about uh, Bahrain and, um, uh, and Libya. Um, when we asked, is Libya better off or worse off, invariably they said worse off. We asked, do you expect Libya to get better in the next uh, five years? Invariably, people said they had no hope for, for the future of Libya. The only country actually that looked good to Arab public opinion was Tunisia. Uh, interestingly enough, the poll in uh, was done not, not in November, it was released in the Arab world in November uh, at this private conference, but we did the poll in September uh, before uh, Sana was overrun by the Houthi movement in, uh, um, in Yemen. And, um, and so Yemen, if you look at the booklet that you have, the Yemen numbers are also quite positive. I, I don't know if we'd get the same right now, but back then the, the Yemen numbers were positive. So Tunisia and Yemen looked good. Um, Egypt did not look good, except in UAE, which gave Egypt very uh, favorable ratings for its chance of uh, future progress and its sense that it's doing better now than it was before. But Syria, like Libya, um, uh, was viewed quite uh, quite negatively, both in terms of um, how it had fared, but also in terms of its future prospects. Here's the future prospects numbers, worse off, significantly higher in every country, except for Lebanon, where about 28% think that it actually might do better in the next five. We then asked a question um, about the, I'm gonna skip over this one for a moment, about whether the Syrian conflict has contributed to increased sectarian tension and radicalization in your country. Uh, we asked it in these, these uh, Arab countries, the four Arab countries, and frankly, it uh, was viewed as having had a significant impact on, on radicalization in every one of the countries questioned. And you'll see that play out in other questions that we ask when you see the sectarian divide, which had been there but has now uh, become something worth 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 noting as a as a factor. Who do you favor in the Syria conflict? Um, predictable, I would I would guess that uh, uh, that in Jordan, Saudi, UAE, and uh, and 
some components of Iraq that the opposition and the Free Syria Army are the favored. Um, predictable also that in Iran and Lebanon, uh, you get very high numbers for Bashar al-Assad. There are some people who still don't get the Lebanon figure. It's not only the Shia, but it's also a significant body of the Christian community in Lebanon have that feeling. Uh, the one that I think is interesting is Turkey, where you get a uh, the, the, the majority in Turkey favor Jebhat al-Nusra. Um, and uh, actually revealing some of the, the feelings that exist in the rest of the Arab world about the role that Turkey has been, been playing in this. Um, who do you favor in the conflict? Here's the Sunni-Shia divide. You can see the, the difference between, especially in Saudi Arabia, stark, absolutely stark, uh, the difference between Sunni attitude and Shia attitude. And for those who say, when they question polling, you know, they say, can you really poll in the Arab world? Do people tell you the truth? When you get a, a significant group of Shia, telling you a position, giving you a position that runs contrary to the position of their own government, that's a that's a, a, a truth indicator of the fact that people are in fact showing you that this is how they feel. Um, much less a divide in UAE um, and, and, um, uh, and in Iran and Lebanon, a divide but not as significant as the Saudi, the Saudi divide. Um, the worst outcome, what's the worst outcome you could project for Syria? Uh, again, predictable. Uh, that Bashar al-Assad remain in control is uh, dreaded by Saudi uh, and Jordan, uh, and there's a division in Iraq. In Syria, I'm sorry, in, in Lebanon and in Iran, on the other hand, um, that, uh, uh, that the Islamic State or like-minded groups would take over. But here's the interesting one. The second most dreaded issue in all the countries is serious fragmentation. That's right up there on the list everywhere and something worth noting. Um, again, uh, we looked at the Sunni-Shia divide in, Iraq, in Saudi Arabia and Iraq, the only two countries here worth noting in terms of the, of the divide. And you'll see that it, uh, it's, it's significant. Uh, on that, that issue. Is it possible to have a negotiated solution to the Syrian conflict? Only Saudi Arabia thinks so. Uh, Iran, somewhat, but f over 50% in Iran, Turkey, uh, Iraq, and Jordan say no. Um, now, we asked about impact of other countries. We asked about a number of countries and their impact. Uh, we're only going to show you four here. This one is first the comparing the U.S. and the Russia impact. Um, you'll note that neither the Russians or the Americans are viewed positively uh, almost anywhere, except the Russians are viewed favorably in Lebanon and Iran, in part because they're supporting the, the side that both the uh, both Iranians and Lebanese are, are favoring in the most part. But in Saudi Arabia and in Jordan and in Iraq and Turkey, you're not getting a lot of high points anywhere. The, the, I think the interesting one is in Iran, where the US having no impact, the yellow line at the end, uh, is the one that the plurality of respondents said um, uh, was the, I, when I first was looking just at the positives, I said, um, I said, uh, the, Iran's numbers are very low. And then I saw the negatives and then I saw the no impact. And I thought that became the storyline there that Iran is just dismissing America having a role at all. Um, here's the, the, the impact of Iran and Saudi Arabia. Um, and uh, predictably in Lebanon, Iran is viewed more positively. Um, but look at the Saudi line and the Iranian line. Um, the, the Saudi line, if you look along the bottom, that's where Saudi Arabia, uh, that's what Saudi Arabians are saying, overwhelmingly view Iran's role as negative. And the last line uh, is Iran overwhelmingly viewing Saudi Arabia's role as, as negative. Here is the Sunni-Shia divide on both of those questions. You see them inverted. In the UAE, the Shia thinking Iran played a very positive role. Um, and, uh, and Sunni, not so. Same in Iraq and same in, in Lebanon. Impact of Syrian refugees on your country. Um, Turkey is, is the one, if you look at the first one on country security, in part because Turkey is so large, it's able to absorb much more so than the others. And so the, the no impact was greater there. Um, but if you look at the economy one, I found that one interesting. The Lebanese split as to whether it was positive or negative. 
I asked a number of Lebanese about that, how they accounted for that number. And they said, it depends on who you are and what your position is in the country. If you're an employer looking for cheap labor, if you're somebody who owns property and you're renting, uh, Syrians are coming in with money. And in fact, they are renting at a rate uh, th they're able to pay higher prices, and so they're driving Lebanese out of the market. They're also working for lower wages, and they're driving Lebanese out of the job market. So if you're an employer or somebody dealing with real estate, the Lebanese seem to be uh, okay with it. But, uh, but they're the only country where there seemed to be an apparent benefit. Um, and so the country is split on that question. Um, now, a couple questions about ISIS. Uh, very grave threat. Somewhat of a threat, no threat at all. Um, the, the countries that view it no threat at all um, are like uh, Saudi Arabia and UAE, uh, far removed uh, from it. I wonder if today, if we did the poll today as opposed to back in September, how the Lebanese would vote uh, today. Because back then, uh, no threat at all got some, I, I wonder if there'd be anyone who'd say no threat at all, but the Lebanese certainly thought it was, uh, w among the countries that thought it was the greatest threat uh, that they faced. Um, do you support direct Western-led military intervention? Only Turkey favored it. Um, Iran uh, came next. S Iraq just at the cusp, 50%. Um, one of the issues that I'm concerned about is that the very low favorable rating for the US in the region coupled with the desire to not have U.S. intervention causes me some concern about the sustainability of, of this mission. Um, two questions about Iraq, better off, worse off in the next five years. Um, frankly, with the exception of the Iranians, who, a plurality, not a majority, who think it'll be better off in the next five, uh, most countries give I I Iraq not a great chance of being better off. Um, uh, I'm gonna skip this. It's just a question about whether they favored a strong centralized Iraq, a loose federation or partition. Um, the Iraqis want a strong centralized. That view is shared by almost every other country except for Iran, uh, which is the one country that would prefer either partition or a loose federation. Um, now, just a few final slides on Iran, which I thought was interesting. We polled about uh, the new president, Rouhani, back in last year when he was just in office for 100 days. Um, the numbers that we got for his expectation of how they thought he would do were, were fairly good. A uh, little over 50% had high expectations and others had no expectations at all. Um, we asked now how his performance has been in the last year on several issues. The only one that was significantly high, I thought, and was interesting, was improving his relations with the Arab world. 56% said he did a great job there on civil rights, on women's rights, on improving the economy. He was under the 50% under the range in terms of job performance. This is the only one where he does really well. But it was striking to me to see the disconnect between what Iranians think of their government and what the rest of the region does. 56% think the best thing he's done is improve relations with the Arab world. Here's what the Arab world thinks about whether Rouhani has moved Iran in a more positive direction. Only Lebanon agrees that it has. And all the other Arab countries, a plurality at least, a majority in Turkey, not Arab country, but Iraq, UAE, and Egypt say no. Uh, Iraq's impact on Syria, uh, Iran's impact on Syria, every one of the countries polled say it had a negative impact, except for the Iranians, are the only ones who think they had a positive impact on Syria. Over 75% say yes. Uh, Iran's opinion on nuclear weapons. Um, I thought this was interesting, because look at the way it grew. In, in 2013, um, we had a majority, um, about 67% said that combined that my country should have a nuclear weapon because we're a major nation or as long as other countries have nuclear weapons, we need them also. That's gone up to almost 90% now combined. 90% of Iranians say they think they should have a weapon either because they're a major country and deserve it or because other countries have them. Um, Somebody's not listening to the spiritual leader. Um, Iran's right to a nuclear program is worth economic sanctions. Apparently, the sanctions are taking a pinch. In 2013, Iranians denied it had any impact on them at all. 
Uh, and today, that has the, the number of those who say that it has has now reached almost 40 percent. Well, that's the end of the. Oh, is anyone confident that the negotiations will succeed in removing the threat of the nuclear program? No one believes that it will succeed. Uh, a real test, I think, for whether or not uh, the region's perception uh, or America's confidence uh, that an agreement can be reached um, is 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 going to be the one to 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 be in the right on this one. Uh, that is the end of the results, and I'm going to turn it over now to the panel. Thank you. So our two respondents this afternoon are John Alterman, who is, uh, and Paul Salem. John is the Senior Vice President at the Brzezinski Chair in Global Security and Geostrategy and Director of the Middle East Program at the Center for Strategic International Studies. Prior to joining CSIS in 2002, he served as a member of the policy planning staff at the U.S. Department of State and as a special assistant to the Assistant Secretary of State for Middle East Affairs. John, thanks so much again for and joining the us. future second. president of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Congratulations. That's who I worked for. Uh, John, I want to start with you. Um, um, what's that? You have to introduce Paul. Unless I go to you with a question, then I come back to Paul. Um, so starting with you, um, specifically on the Arab Spring uh, portion of this. It is expected um, that folks might have a different perspective um, when their countries are experiencing a certain level of upheaval. But what I thought interesting is the, the slide that uh, Jim showed us with increased unfavorables regarding the Arab Spring in both the UAE and Saudi Arabia. Um, share with us what you think the, the impact um, um, where it hasn't been particularly outwardly in, in either country in terms of the Arab Spring. Um, why you think that might be the case in the Gulf and the perceptions that way? Yeah, one of the, thank you for that question. One of the things that I found striking um, was how many people in the UAE felt the UAE was better off after the Arab Spring. The answer in the polling books that you have is 53% of Emiratis said the UAE is better off after the Arab Spring. And I don't know what constitutes that. I mean, where does that come from? Because the UAE, if anything, is more concerned with the infiltration of the Muslim Brotherhood. I guess you could say that people antagonized by the Arab Spring have moved to the UAE, but it doesn't feel like, like the, the sorts of conditions that people are responding to have really materially changed. Uh, and yet there's this real difference with Saudi Arabia uh, where people are, are evenly divided whether Saudi Arabia is better off or worse off. And in the UAE, it's a very big difference. Um, I think it probably has to do with something more subtle, which is a sense of self-confidence. That Saudi Arabia is not very self-confident. Saudi Arabia is facing economic challenges. They worry strategically about the the uh, durability of the U.S. ties. Uh, they're worried about falling oil prices. There's really a sense, I think, in Saudi of a wonder whether this really can endure. And I think a self-confidence in the Emirates that we've placed a number of bets. We have a resilient model. We've been able to get through the financial crisis in Dubai and the, the, the business environment is picking up again. And it seems to me that it's not so much about the Arab Spring itself as a sense of we have resilience in our society, we have resilience in our economy, we have resilience in our model, and a sense in Saudi Arabia in particular that maybe we're going to have to make some hard changes that we hadn't mm -hmm. quite been ready for. I, can I, I just come in on that because it's an issue that we've noted. I call it the Bill Clinton effect. It, during the Clinton years, when we polled on American attitudes towards anything, everything was great. It, it, in the very last Clinton year, 2000, uh, we did a poll on attitudes towards Saudi Arabia. 
60 something percent had a favorable rating of Saudi Arabia. They didn't know anything about it, but they had a favorable rating about it. Um, and they felt good. Everything was working. They had jobs. The economy was doing well. You know, things were at peace, and therefore they were rosy and happy about everything. In the Bush years, the country went to hell. And I mean, you just saw the, 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 the I think it was a graph in the New York Times today about the right track, wrong track. Uh, the, the right track number when Bush took office was up here. By the time he, he finished office, it was at 19% right track, 60-something percent wrong track. Ask them anything about anything, and they're going to give you a grumpy answer. And so that's what you got. I think you're absolutely right, John. It's uh, Emiratis feel good, and therefore everything is, 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 is going to be sort of colored with that brush. Um, Let me add to that just on the Emirati thing. I think the Emiratis, since the Arab Spring and their foreign policy, have become much more active. Uh, in addition to the feel-good factor, because things in the Emirates are good, and most people, Emiratis at least, feel good about it, this new robust role that Emirates is playing, for better or for worse, in the region, you talk to a lot of Emiratis, and that is linked to events of the Arab Spring. They say, well, you know, it's time, Emirati, the Emirates is playing a big role, they feel proud, and, and that, I think, factors uh, into it a bit. Thank you, John. Let's uh, introduce Paul Salem, who is the Vice President for Policy and Research at the Middle East Institute. He focuses on issues of political change, democratic transition, and conflict, with a regional emphasis on the countries of the Levant and Egypt. Uh, Paul, thank you so much again. Thank you, Maria. in already. I think th the question I wanted to start um, with you on is specifically the, the question on Syrian conflict contributing to increased sectarian tension and radicalization in your country. And it's not surprising, obviously, that Lebanon would have very high numbers in that regard, uh, as well as others. But I wanted you to touch on the, the um, Saudi Arabian numbers in particular. And I, I think perhaps it goes to the point that John started making as well. Um, significantly higher numbers there. Um, just share with us your perspective on that. Well, I mean, there was a you know a bunch of graphs about the Syria conflict, a lot of which were very interesting. Some of them are the ones that uh, you uh, you point to. Um, it's very difficult, I think, to ask people their opinion about how the Syrian situation is going to end up because it's it's obviously so bad now. It's obviously going to be bad for a long time. Any person who follows the news uh, will conclude that. Uh, perhaps the most surprising couple of results on the Syria polling, to my mind, related to Turkey more than Saudi Arabia or, or Jordan or Lebanon, which did not surprise me much. And those were the two results which seemed to go in different directions. One, that in Turkey there was the highest support for Jabhat al-Nusra. forget what the exact number was, but very significant. And I was going to ask you, Jim, if in that same question, is ISIS included as a potential winner of the conflict? Did anybody... It is. I mean... It's, it's included in other questions, mm -hmm. but it's not tabulated when you said who's going to win, who do you favor to win the conflict. In the I, table, I, I it says... I think the way that question was framed yeah. was, was um, uh, and other Islamist-minded groups, wasn't it, John? It, I'm that sure was the question on ISIS. Yeah. In other words, my question is, the numbers for Turkey of Jabhat al-Nusra are alarmingly large. There might even be more for ISIS. What that contradicts... Uh, not contradicts, but it's a very interesting result that on the question of do you support a U.S.-led initiative, the Turks also in large numbers say, yes, we support a U.S.-led no. initiative uh, to, just uh, for to, the, to, to act in Syria. And those seem to be going in an interesting, contradictory direction. To answer your question, the, the, it's on page 12 of the handout. Um, in the conflict raging in Syria, whom do you most favor? In Turkey, 40% favored Jabhat al-Nusra. The number two was the Islamic Front. The Islamic State polled zero. Um, interestingly, and I, don't, I have no idea why this is true, the only place where the Islamic State had, or Daesh, or ISIL, or ISIS, had any significant following is the UAE, where it polled about 13%. And otherwise, it's about 1% or 2%. It's, it's confounding. The, 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 in, in the UAE, the numbers are going to always be skewed because we poll Arabs in the UAE and not just Emirati citizens. And so e even there on the better off, worse off, the sense of well-being of I'm not in my country, but I'm here and I'm doing well. I got a great job and, and I'm sending money home is, is part of the skewing, I think, of the, of the results. I think it's about uh, when we just do Arab speakers in UAE, I think it's about 40% national 
and 60% expat. Mm -hmm. So that would account, I think, for some of the, the skewing. The Daesh supporters. Yes. It, it, it could Not Emiratis, possibly, is what you're saying. Right, right. Let me just say, for those watching and, and not um, here, if you don't have a copy of the poll, you can get one on AAI USA or on our site, which has all of our past polling, zogbyresearchservices.com. Uh, zogbyresearchservices.com, and you can get and look at the copy of the poll and follow along. Maya, if I may, I wanted to comment a bit on the overall, you know, mm -hmm. sort of what, Please. what what struck me a bit uh, in the overall findings of the poll on the Arab Spring and sort of the grander narratives of things. I mean, as Jim says, uh, maybe three, four years ago, there was a dominant narrative that, you know, there were events happening, young people protesting, there was hope, there was a common thread, a common logic as to what uh, people hoped at least would unfold and were feeling good about that. And now we are at a moment of where, you know, any unifying narrative, let alone positive or negative, uh, has been lost. And I say that not only as a as a comment and a reality, because indeed it has. People have concerns about ISIS, about civil wars, about uh, returning authoritarianism and other issues, that it's very serious that the Arab world today has lost the narrative, has lost a vision of where they are and where they want to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, I think, has very dramatic and negative consequences. Because unless there is a fairly commonly shared vision of how things need to change, uh, those changes will not come about, they will not be coordinated, and we will not see progress if you don't have a vision of it Although first. I and that's what I think is a bit problematic. My second comment, just to uh, conclude on sort of my overall impression, is the questions about the Arab Spring, which are very legitimate, are, you know, are things better now than in 2011 when the Arab uprisings and spring began. I mean, obviously, overall, they are not, because many very difficult things happen and countries have collapsed and so on. It would be interesting to poll, and I know some other polls have done it, but maybe not as recently, as to what the attitudes uh, with regards to the the hopes or the, you know, the, the values put forward that by the Arab Spring. Are those still, the, you know, is democracy still things people want? Uh, certainly the situation is bad, and anybody who reads the newspaper can conclude that in a poll, uh, but have people turned away from the choices they expect, expressed in 2011? And that my, links me to the results on Tunisia, that people said things are definitely worse off now than they are, but they like what happened in Tunisia, which was kind of an expression of sort of the Arab Spring as it was more or less supposed to happen. And that might indicate an, an, at least a, a hopeful uh, aspect. But it seems to me there are two dominant narratives, certainly two narratives I hear in, in the Arab world. One is the narrative of we dodged the bullet, right? That, that, that in turning back what they saw as a Muslim Brotherhood grab for power in Egypt and secondarily in Tunisia, that the region is headed towards stability, that Egypt is the anchor, that the, the region was about to fall into Islamist tyranny and pulled back from the brink. And the other uh, countervailing narrative is we were robbed. We participated in the system. We thought that we could uh, be accommodated. And the entire, the entire game is illegitimate. Uh, as several Egyptians told me when I was there in May, um, I'm not voting in the presidential election because I have a president and he's in jail. Right? And, and I think these are the two narratives. The narrative I hear less of is the democratization narrative, the participation narrative. We'll see if Tunisia turns into something that becomes an attractive model that resurrects an argument that the region has to move forward, it has to accommodate uh, young people in a different way, it has to accommodate a more educated and connected population. I don't think we're there yet. What I am hearing, and I'm hearing one of two, depending on who I'm talking to, is either, whew, we dodge that, or you know, thank God we didn't fall into the chaos of Libya and Syria, and there's sort of this sense of relief, or the whole game is rigged. And I think those those are the two narratives. And and the problem is it leads you toward the polarization that Jim's polling saw in Egypt, where you say is Muslim Brotherhood positive or negative effect, and you get 43 percent positive, 44 percent negative, and that's got to make you well. That's it's hard. It's hard to bring that together, and you look at what's happening in, in 
you know, public life in Egypt, where there is clearly one side that is arguing in public and in private, those guys are only 5% and we're going to take care of them. And you look at these numbers and say they're 43%, not 5%. That's a lot different dealing with 43% of your population than 5% of your population. I, I, let, me, let me just talk about Egypt for a minute. If you look in the 2011 poll, um, which I also it was available out there, and it's online if you haven't got it, we asked about political priorities. And this is after Arab Spring is already underway. I mean, the poll was uh, done about eight months into the after the fall of President Mubarak. We asked the Egyptians what their top concerns were. And in Egypt, the top concerns in 2011, end of 2011, were exactly what they were in the year before that when we polled. It was the economy. They wanted jobs. And then it was education. And then it was ending corruption and nepotism. And then it was health care. The issues of democracy and political participation and all that stuff were like 9, 10, like way down at the bottom. I don't believe that Egypt was ever about democracy. I really think it was about he's been in office too long and he's going to pass it off to his son and all these guys are making a bundle off of it and we don't have jobs. They wanted a transparent government that would serve the needs of people and not the needs of an elite. I mean, remember the people were hyping back then the fact that the Egyptian economy was growing, but it was growing for a small group of people and the income gap, something like America, um, between rich and poor was huge. And I, I, I that hasn't changed. And so I, I, I sometimes think that the we almost, because we didn't understand what was going on, we fell into a, a, a sort of a comfortable narrative that this was really about democracy. I don't think Tunisia was about democracy either as much as it was about jobs and the economy and a young genera a generation of people that had no hope. And, and so the, I think the story is still out that is, is, is a government going to come in Egypt and in Tunisia and in other countries similarly affected, that's actually affected by this, uh, this turmoil, that's going to produce what people want. And what people want right now are jobs. So, so to put but, but that mean, I mean, I mean to, you know, to, to pry a bit on that, I mean, first of all, they're not, definitely not contradictory. What most no. people want in the U.S. and other places are jobs and health care and a lot of things like that. But it is very significant that as the uprisings unfolded, a, they gained a tremendous dramatic narrative, uh, and the political mechanisms that were called for weren't any sophisticated list of Jeffersonian anything, but it was, we don't want dictators, we don't want another, you know, somebody, a military ruler to come in. Uh, we don't, I mean, we, uh, nobody was clamoring for Islamist government in the uprisings per se. It has to be said that despite the fact that it wasn't elaborated in any, in any effective way, unlike uprisings in the Arab world in the 20s, in the 50s, in the 70s, where some that uprising was, you know, pro-military or pro-socialist or pro-Arab nationalist, when you boil it down, the political, uh, uh, the political aspect of the type of government they wanted was they choose their rulers, there is a constitutional order, there's rule of law, there's no corruption. Uh, those taken together are a political choice. And that was very powerful in 2011, 2012. The narrative, as uh, John is pointing out, what people think about now, and that's why I'm saying the narratives have been overtaken. Now they think, as you say, we dodged a bullet, or we were robbed, or something negative. Uh, but I'm, you know, I, 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 and that's that's very problematic because there is no longer a a project. There's no longer a model. Now we're bickering over what happened, and we see that very much in this poll. We see that when we travel around the region. But I'm asking, underneath that, are there any new choices for types of government? Can I also add from each of you to hear on this point about? The Arab Spring became part of the narrative for all the countries, whether they're experiencing um, change or not. Uh, what about the, the, the ISIL piece, right? I mean, there is a when you when you did the polling on this, in addition to sort of just visceral reactions of n negative feedback on it, um, 
how has that impacted the, the, the broader conversation about their rights uh, when someone shows up and says sykes Code is over and, we're, and they engage in this level of violence the way that it's, that's been happening? I mean, one of the challenges of, of the, the ISIL, Daesh, Islamic State, Islamic State Group, whatever acronym you want to use, um, is that these guys aren't looking for a majority. Right? I mean, one of the things about the revolutionaries, one of the things even about the, the military in Egypt, is they were aspiring for majority support. One of the characteristics of the Egyptian military is it has spectacularly broad support in Egyptian society. If you look at the polling, while those numbers are going down, I think there is a concept picking up on Paul's idea. What people wanted was competence, right? They wanted results, and the military in Egypt is recognized as providing results, and the military is conscious of that and was looking to keep a majority on its side. The nature of ISIL, Daesh, whatever, is they want to be a vanguard. They're happy to be one percent. They're happy to be the one percenters. They're happy to be the half of one percenters, right? And and I think as a as you think about the way the politics work, most people say those guys are crazy. I don't support that at all. And after 9-11, we had this concept. Our construct was a majority of populations in the Arab world were going to support Osama bin Laden. What I think is the reality, and perhaps even more troubling, is we may have an enduring half of 1% that is incredibly murderous and transnational as far as the eye can see. And they're okay with that. And tracking down, persuading the half of 1%, or even a smaller fraction, is a really hard problem for governments that have a whole host of domestic problems, where there is the problem delivering services, there's a problem sustaining the police forces. I mean, we saw this in, in the Arab uprisings, and the police forces have been weakened. And you give them this enduring, resilient challenge of not controlling a majority or group that aspires to majority, but how do you deal with a small murderous minority? But also the sharp contrast be between what were the ideals of the Irish Spring and the conversations that were had at that time versus the response to this kind of violence. I think, I mean, ISIS comes out really of the conflict in Syria. And that is, you know, the huge engine of, of you know, slaughter and mayhem and brutality that was effectively initiated as a pro process by the Assad regime, which said, we're not going to negotiate. Uh, we're going to deal with this militarily. That, by definition, weakens anybody on the other side who's saying, wait, let's, you know, let's negotiate or let's take a moderate tone. And it, it certainly empowers uh, people who are saying, well, they're being militant. Let's be militant as well. That's a proper response. Uh, and given the sectarian nature of how it was promoted effectively in Syria, partly by the regime, and then it picked up as a, as a forest fire, uh, the, res you know, the response has simply boiled down to a sectarian bloodbath. And that the Assad regime, which has killed maybe 150 conservatively, 150,000, you know, displaced, millions, tortured, tens of thousands, you know, I'll talk to some people, they say, of course we hate ISIS, but how many people has ISIS killed? 3,000, 4,000. Now, most of those are on, are on YouTube and they're horrific and we see them. You don't see the effect of every barrel bomb of the tens of thousands and so on. Uh, so, uh, I mean, as the polls show, people don't support ISIS to come to their country. They don't want that uh, in any way. But when, you know, for some people who I talk to are very reasonable people and uh, say, you know, Assad regime is doing this, and there are these groups fighting the Assad regime. They'll say, well, I don't like ISIS, but it's one of the groups that, you know, is fighting this, this enormously barbaric situation, and they give it some leeway uh, in that context. It has very little to do with the Arab Spring or their ideals, but uh, it is a very, very, uh, you know, bloody sectarian conflict that evokes these sectarian feelings. And the polling, I think, uh, confirms that heavy sectarianism. You know, there, there, there's two things going on here. There's the aspiration side. Um, the, the aspiration side, the side that that is uh, the narrative that plays out the kind of world we want to live in. Uh, and then there's the um, I'm mad as hell narrative. 
Um, I don't see the opening to create the society I want to live in. I'm just going to get my licks in while I can. Um, I worked with Reverend Jackson in the 84 and 88 presidential campaign. I was his deputy campaign manager. And we faced a hell of a time from, from Louis Farrakhan. Every time Reverend Jackson would start to move up and things would start to look good, Farrakhan would say something outrageous and do something outrageous. And everything would turn uh, into what are you going to say about Louis Farrakhan? And there would be statements from organizations and from Congress. Reverend Jackson has to denounce Louis Farrakhan. It sucked the life out of the campaign several times. I went to Ron Walters, uh, one of the most brilliant political analysts um, that I knew here in Washington. It was at Howard and then moved over to University of Maryland. And I said, what's going on here? And he said, he's the measure of the depth of black alienation from white America. And he knows it. He knows that whenever he wants to play that chord, he can play it because it doesn't matter who it is, that his constituency is mad at hell. And they don't mind somebody reflecting that mad as hell. And I think that some of that has to do with the ISIS thing. I don't want him in my country, but shit, they're really kicking kicking some butt over in Syria right now, right? And they're getting the bad guys over in, uh, in, in Iraq right now. And they're doing this and there is that sense that that it's almost a kind of a visceral anger. Um, that some of it from the uh, from the U.S. occupation of Iraq and the dispossession of Sunni and the the Ba'ath Party, and some of it is the Assad history, not just the last couple of years, but mm -hmm. a dispossessed majority in in Syria, um, and some of it is just anger at the West. Period, um, and so it it, it creates a, a. That's one of the reasons why I'm a little tentative about. The U.S. involvement. And I look at those numbers because ISIS's numbers are bad, but ours aren't very good either. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it ain't. It, it may not necessarily be the fight you want to get into uh, to show that your favorable rating of seven is a little better than their favorable rating of five. Um, when there's a public opinion, we're fifty percent more popular. <laughs> I actually forty percent more popular. Um, the it 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 it. It's a risky proposition because, um, you know, I, I hate to say this. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm an American. I'm proud of my country, et cetera. But, you know, when, when the torture report comes out and the, the, the you know, the, all of the rest comes out, it, it, it puts us in a position where it's awfully difficult for us to be the conveyor of value uh, as much as it is the target of anger. And, and that becomes then an issue I think we have to, we have to look at. I, I, I go back in this town to the Afghani guys coming and sitting in my office saying, you've got to come and support us. If you come and support us, we'll be your friends for life. That didn't last very long. And it didn't last very long in Libya either. And I'm not sure how long it lasts. You know, they want us in until we get in. And then it always doesn't play out so well uh, because we're an easy target. And um, uh, the reason why we're an easy target goes beyond the discussion of this poll, but I think that, you know, I just look at the numbers and they, they, they're they not too pretty. It's, popular it's very popular. People make hay yeah, out sure. of it. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go ahead and open it up for questions and answers in just one moment. Staying on this U.S. piece, um, Jim, if the majority do not believe a negotiated settlement is possible in Syria, with the exception of Saudi Arabia, um, and our negatives are, as as you've pointed out, um, and ask each of you actually to comment on this, what do you think is the best course of action in light? Well, of look in the in the last poll we did, the one that we did back in June of this year, um, we asked their favorite outcome, uh, how they thought the issue should be resolved in Syria. They preferred a negotiation over uh, military engagement. Uh, and in Iran, how to deal with the nuclear question, they preferred um, uh, uh, the negotiations, the P5 plus one. They didn't favor taking military action against Iran. And yet another question in this poll that we didn't list was, do, are, do, are you confident that the negotiations with Iran will succeed? Oh, we did. They said no. And are you confident the negotiations with Syria? No. They want negotiations instead of military. They just don't have confidence they'll work. There's a, a a problem there. I'm not quite sure how to analyze it. I mean, maybe you guys can do better. But I, I, they don't want military action from us. Even if the governments want it, popular opinion isn't as, as favorably inclined in that direction. Well, I mean, I think on Syria, the assessment that people are making in the poll 
is an assessment of what they see currently as the situation in Syria, where Geneva 1 and Geneva 2 have failed. There is no U.S. Russian relationship, which was holding that together. Iranian Arab relations are at a very, very poor state. There is no Syrian track to negotiate anything. Uh, ISIS has and Jubhat al-Nusra have dominated the opposition, making negotiations, at least for the time being, uh, not likely. And the Assad regime more or less feels confident, has declared, has no serious intent currently to negotiate anything seriously. So that conclusion by these populations is a reading of the situation that's accurate. And I would agree with that, uh, that in 2015, I don't see the conditions for a negotiated solution. Now, at the end of the year, the decade, you know, and then the whole process, maybe that is the only way out, but the elements are not there. On the uh, Iran side, there were some also very interesting results, and I want to ask Jim about, about part of that. Uh, I mean, one, the response about their optimism about the negotiations is partly linked, I mean, the negative response is partly linked to their negative view of Iran that what they see of Iran is Hezbollah supporting Bashar, butchering people, you know, supporting this, uh, uh, Maliki in Iraq, militias, the Houthis. They see Iran doing these things, and they say, well, is Iran going to sit down and legitimately come clean while it's playing so dirty in the rest of the region? I think that's why they have that kind of, that kind of result. It does not surprise me. My question about Iran, I was very struck by the numbers you showed between 2014 and even 2013, I think you said, when the Iranians, when asked, do the sacrifices, you know, the sanctions, so on, justify, and, and the number jumped from something insignificant to around 25, 30%, I don't have it in front of me, that people are saying, maybe this is too costly. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I would wonder, after the collapse of oil prices, if you polled today or later this year, it's, you know, I would think if you follow that trajectory, it's got to be in the crossing the 50% mark. And that is a very significant thing for Iran and the Iranian government if that line is seriously moving in that direction. I, I, think, that, I think that's right. Um, I, I think the, the, they, aspirationally, they may want sure. a nuclear re weapon, but they're feeling the pinch now more. And I think you're right. If we polled now, I think the pinch would be even greater. Shall we open it up to questions? Um, we'll go. There, please identify yourself in the question. Okay. Uh, Mohammed Al Satouhi, uh, Al Ghad Al Arabi. Uh, thanks, Jim, for this work. But uh, I have a couple of questions and maybe clarifications because I just had a chance to read the results. Uh, did you ask people in Tunis whether or not they are better off now? because I saw the, uh, the results in Egypt and a couple of other countries, but I didn't find this question. I, I found a question about the role of the Muslim Brotherhood, but nothing, because for comparison reasons, you know. Um, uh, the other, uh, uh, I, actually, I can just answer that while you're looking. Uh, oh. We polled in Tunisia uh, last year. And actually, we, we released it also with the Middle East Institute at the time. Uh, we did not poll in, in this poll, we did not poll in Tunisia. We polled in eight countries, six Arab and then Turkey and, and, and Iran, eight countries total, uh, about Tunisia, but we didn't poll in Tunisia. So uh, we asked others, did they think Tunisians were better off? And the answer oh. in most of the countries were yes, they did think it was better off. We didn't ask Tunisians in this poll. Okay. But if I may, uh, the on, other that, on, yeah, Muhammad, on that question, and you know that's something I mentioned at the initial part of the poll, I could imagine Tunisians saying, I'm not better off now, but most Tunisians I talk to, if I ask them, are you happy about the consensual constitution, that you've managed <laughs> to hold elections, are you happy with that process? Many of them will tell me, most of them were proud, were happy, that was the right thing to do. We're not better off now, our economy is worse. So it doesn't mean, you know, there are different questions to, to different phenomena. I think. Okay, uh, did you get any, uh, uh, at least answer, uh, I didn't find any question here. Uh, they are worse off, mostly in uh, their spring countries, but you didn't ask them who is to blame whether it is the Muslim Brotherhood, whether it is the young activists or the government. Uh, did you have any chance to get any In this poll, we did not ask that question. Uh, 
we're, we're sort of limited by the number of questions we can ask in, in different polls and we had a lot of areas to cover. We did ask that question in Egypt in June and the results will be in, in that poll. Uh, the blame, they still cast the blame majority on President Mubarak um, and and then after that on uh, on President Morsi. Um, I, just, just a comment about that because it, it came up for a minute there about the 43% I'm not sure that that's a 43% support for the Brotherhood, as much as it is a um, uh, a sense of dissatisfaction with the direction things are moving. Um, I, I think that the 22% back in in um, in May of 2013 was probably the Brotherhood, maybe ceiling and floor, right in that in that range, right around there. I think everything after that is more a sense of I'm not happy with the way things are going. I don't like what the government's doing. Um, and therefore, uh, when you ask me a question about th those other guys, I'm going to say something positive. I'm, I'm not going to be with the dominant the dominant line that's coming from, from the government right now, because I'm not happy with what they're doing. When we asked Egyptians last year in three separate polls, what they wanted most outcome for the country. They said national reconciliation between the competing forces. That was the thing, and that never varied. We asked them in May, we asked them in Ju in July, and we asked them in September, do you favor the military uh, assuming control? 40% said yes, 50 something percent said no. That never changed. National reconciliation never changed. And so that's the outcome they want, and I don't think they're happy with it, which is why the Brotherhood numbers go up. I, if there were an election today, the Brotherhood is not going to get 43 percent. They're not. Uh, there was an existential threat to many Egyptians posed by the Brotherhood, um, and now there's an existential threat to many Egyptians posed by the direction the country's moving. And so I think there's a real quandary there. John, you want to come so, in on So that? I would say it's not 43 percent support for the Brotherhood, but 43 percent support for competition. Yeah. I think that's right. That's right. Let's go to a question here. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Tyler Thompson from United for a Free Syria and the Coalition for a Democratic Syria. Both my questions are for you, Mr. Zogby. Uh, first off, I mean, I know it's a small population, but I w I'm wondering whether um, Qatar was is a uh, country of interest to you with these polls since they played such a uh, re relatively influential role in the Arab uh, Spring countries. And then second, um, you seem to suggest that the United States shouldn't bother intervening in Syria because of the results of a popular poll suggest that the U.S. has done a poor job thus far. Um, you know, it, it doesn't really uh, incorporate, I guess, some of the key pressure points that the United States might be able to play a more positive role. And I'm just wondering why or how you've reached that conclusion yeah. based on the popular First poll. First of all, we didn't poll in Qatar in, in this poll. But we did poll about Qatar in this poll, um, and their performance, um, they're, uh, it, they're judged pretty, pretty, pretty poorly. Um, and I, I just, you know, just take a look at the numbers. Uh, in most countries, uh, people said they did not have a positive impact in Syria. Um, I didn't say the U.S. shouldn't. I said there are warning signs about th that I'm concerned about about what the U.S. is doing right now, because when your ratings are so low and when people are saying that they don't want Western-led intervention, and this poll was done largely before the intervention began, uh, I think that it, 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 it's not like we've never seen this happen before, you know? Um, and so I, I, based on that, I think that there are issues here to be concerned about. That's, that would be the way I'd frame it. But I, I wonder, and it's hard to, you know, determine this, but a lot of what happened between 2013 and 2014, a lot of issues surrounded Syria. Yeah. Uh, what the U.S. did, what it didn't do, you know, the chemical weapons threat and then the deal. Uh, in, the, in, in Arab public opinion, there's great hostility, obviously, to Assad, which is why Iran and Hezbollah's numbers, Hezbollah and Iran used to poll by far the most popular 70 percent in the Arab Sunni yeah. world and they are now obviously at the bottom. It's because of, only because of Syria. I call it the nail in the coffin. It's definitely uh, the thing that brought them from, you know, popular to terribly unpopular. Uh, and I'm, you know, wondering to what extent U.S. 
in action in Syria, because when I go around the region and when they talk about the U.S. role, it's largely about the U.S. role in Syria. Yes, there's issues about Israel and Gaza and colonialism. You know, there's, a, there's baggage. But in the here and now, it's you're not, and even in the war on ISIS, you're going after the murderous Sunni group, but you are not touching the murderous other group, which has killed far more. And people say, well, we don't like Obama because partly because of that. And I'm wondering, hence, is this number a fixed number or it's dependent on policy? In June, we specifically asked that question, what do you most want the U.S. to do? And we gave them a series of options. The military option, and, and in June of this year, uh, there was not significant change in the barbarity of the regime. Um, it's, uh, you know, uh, some things changed fr from June till now, but I think the region's uh, uh, fear or, 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 yeah. or, 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 or hatred of the regime in, in Damascus was about where it is now. Uh, they did not want U.S. military involvement in Syria. They just didn't want it. Um, and I think that that's an issue that, that requires being looked at. I mean, why are they saying that? They, 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 you, you say to them, do you, what do you want the U.S. to do? And in, in, in the the single, the number one preference was to bring the parties together for negotiations. They have no confidence that negotiations will work, but that's what they want, as opposed to bombing the country. I, I, I this is not me talking. I'm yeah. saying this is what the this is what public opinion in these Arab countries. Now there are some who say it doesn't matter what the Egyptians think or what the Jordanians think or what the Lebanese. Yeah, what yeah I, I I get it, but yeah. the point is is that. We operate in a country, we also operate in a region, and we've seen how this reverberates and the impact it has in several situations in the past. That's the, uh, you look, and, and if Syria is the nail in the coffin for Iranian opinion rating in the region, uh, Israel and Palestine is the nail in the American coffin. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were to do a Mr. Gorbachev tear this wall down to Netanyahu, would that enhance our ability to do something in Syria? For all those who say that the Israeli-Palestinian issue is not important, it's secondary, it's tertiary importance, whatever in the Arab world, it's not true. Our standing is in part derivative of our behavior on that front. And therefore, uh, would it make a difference? I don't know. We never tried in the last 60, 70 years. And so it might be worth it might be worth looking at to see what you can do to enhance your image. Let's go to a question there, and then we'll do the next two over here. Uh, Marina Ottawa with the Wilson Center. Uh, my first comment really goes back to the issue of this apparently rehabilitation of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And I am tempted, a bit like uh, John, to really read it an increasing uh, negative judgment on the military. Yeah. In other words, because the, the, in a sense, it makes no sense because the Muslim Brotherhood has not done anything to become rehabilitated right. at this point. Right. So I think it's more really the unease with the, with the present right. uh, regime. The second point, I wanted to go back to the comment you made about ISIL or whatever we want to call it, uh, being happy to be uh, sort of the, the one percenters or the half percenters and so on. And I think we are one of the paradoxes of the Arab Spring is that a lot of these regimes that are emerging are happy to be the one percenters or the half percenters. In other words, I don't think it's true that they are curing popular approval. The military in Egypt is not curing popular approval. It's telling the, pop, uh, the population what we are doing, what is good for you. But it's not a regime that it's looking for approval. None of the groups that are fighting in Libya or Yemen and so on, you know, whatever you want, are looking for popular approval. So it seems to me that one of the paradoxes of these so-called democratic uprisings is that we are going back very much to governments that are as from the top down as any government has ever been in the Arab world. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah I, w I was the one who, who yeah. Made the comment that you the one. we're not sure of. So, so let me. I think actually, the governments do want the consent of the governed, and the way they do it is they they harp on the danger of the one percent. So there's a utility in having the seed of what is burning up. Libya and Syria, 
in your country because that means we have to be vigilant and we have to right and and i think they're they're trying to rally the populations they're using the sense of an imminent threat they are using what is happening in syria and libya to their advantage to talk about the fragility of the current environment and they are capitalizing on that fear to maintain the support of what they see as the bulk of the population. We just put out a report. If you're going to plug your stuff, I'm going to plug my stuff. Mm -hmm. On Monday, we released a book um, uh, on uh, religious radicalism after the Arab uprising. So it's on the CSS website. Um, it is intriguing and disturbing that the groups that have really expanded their reach the most are the radical groups, partly because they took advantage of the collapse in police presence, partly because they learned a lot of the lessons of social media, uh, of the revolutionary groups, but partly also because these radical groups have taken advantage of the fact that they don't aspire to majority rule. And I think we are at a point where the authoritarian governments not only aspire to having majority support, I think they think they can secure majority support. And part of the way they do that is by making everybody feel they're going to keep you away from radicalism, they're going to keep you away from revolution, they're going to keep you away from all the things that will threaten everything and trust us to keep a lid on things and we will move forward together. How well that will work is unclear. As people used to talk about in Egypt, until quite recently, when you didn't talk about these things in Egypt anymore, the last two presidents in Egypt who failed to deliver economically are in jail, right? And I think th there is a fear that if you can't make this work economically, politically, or otherwise, the military now in Egypt is front and center. It will be blamed if it's not able to perform. It is a high stakes balancing act. <clears throat> but I think the military thinks that's their only option. They are trying to make it work, and I think they are confident that they have the majority of the population on their side. If they lose the majority of the population, and I don't think they have quite yet, um, then we are in for some very rocky times. Let's go here, and then to the question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Peter Gluck. Um, on table 22, and you spoke about this before, uh, all seven of the countries are not confident that the nuclear negotiations with Iran will come to a successful conclusion. The majorities are quite strong, as a matter of fact. Yet, earlier this week in the New York Times, there was an article reporting the opinion of several Iranian business people who expressed a fairly high sense of optimism. Um, maybe it's unfounded, I don't know, but a uh, fairly high sense of optimism that the negotiations would come to a successful conclusion and that their businesses would pick up. Can you square those two things? Um, what the Iranian businessmen say is what they want to believe to be true, and what the Lebanese, Jordanian, Egyptian, Saudi, Emirati is, is what they what they believe to be true as well. And so uh, the Iranians want to believe it's true. John Kerry wants to believe that we're going to get real close to getting a deal. But Arab public opinion doesn't have confidence. And I think that this, this lack of confidence issue, one of the things I saw in the June poll we did, which was we called it five years after Cairo, uh, Arabs looking at the Obama administration, was uh, an, an an issue of a lack of trust and confidence in America right now. Um, and, um, and I think that that's a troubling fact. Um, and, I, and I don't think it's easily solved by, you know, bombing in Syria or by uh, pulling off the negotiations with Iran. It, 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 there's a deeper history there that I think has to be played out and, and understood. But, uh, you know, negotiations between U.S. and Iran, how, how successful it would be? I don't think so. You know, I mean, that, that's what they're going to tell you. So um, if, it, if it works, I think it's a, it's, a, a, it's a tremendous plus for the president and for, for the United States. And it may help chip away at some of the lack of confidence. I happen to think that what we did with Cuba uh, is going to help 
improve a lot of attitudes. But people are going to be saying, yeah, but what about? And so there's a lot of tests for America they have to be dealing with right now and, uh, and to turn these numbers around. It, it is not the case, in other words, that when we, you know, we're not King Midas in the region. Uh, when we touch it, it turns to gold. There's not yet that sense, or there isn't that sense. And I think we have a lot to do to get there, to get to the point where we like to see ourselves. Well, also on the Iranian thing, I mean, talking to a lot of Iranians, and as the poll indicates, about half of the Iranians want, you know, the Rouhani track and so on to succeed. Part of that is, you know, a deal on the nuclear lifting of sanctions, normalization of relations. It's a major part of Iranian life and Iranian public opinion. In the Arab world, as I've indicated, first there's a high level of distrust and hostility to Iran. And when you ask many Arabs about the talks, they wish for them not to succeed because they fear the talks mean an American-Iranian deal at their expense. Yeah. So it's not only they distrust, they're not even excited about a deal. They, well, they see it. Like in both things. parties, America and Iran. But on the Iranian side, I mean, there, there's sort of two ways to win on the Iranian side. One is if you normalize relations with the United States. And the other is that the United States self-isolates so much by asking for things that the rest of the world considers unreasonable. So Asian consuming countries say, well, I mean, the Iranians are putting forward a good faith effort. Maybe we should relax some of this and the sanctions start to wear away. And I think that either one is an advantage for the Iranians. Either there's the advantage of you make the deal with the Americans, although a lot of Iranians think that the American strategic objective is to undermine the revolution, right? And so, and so it's not actually in the Iranians' interest. And the other is that the sanctions begin to erode because the Americans are asking for too much because the Republican Congress is trying to, to really put the screws to the Iranians and the Chinese and the Indians and others say, that's crazy. And it seems to me that the part of the optimism from the Iranian perspective is not necessarily they'll work it with the Americans, but that the Americans will work themselves out of this remarkable multilateral sanctions regime, which Mahmoud Ahmadinejad reinforced every single day he was in office. But I, let me, I mean, let me, I, if, let me, if I may, the, yeah. the drop of oil prices has changed the scene. The calculus, uh, the yeah. calculus for Iran, they don't have the luxury to wait. And, you know, it's a, it's a new world that Iran is living in now. And I, I was just thinking, John, though, that, that uh, from what you said about the Iranian perception that if a deal is made, it's going to undercut the revolution. Um, and if you talk to people here um, on the hardliners here uh, or in the Arab world, their fear is, is that if a deal is made, uh, Iran's isolation has ended and Iran's going to become the dominant power in the region. Extremists or hardliners on both sides ought to listen to the other side. Uh, they'd get validation for their point of view. Let's take another question here. Mohammed Shina, Voice of America. The poll showed a very pessimistic perception of any positive role that Muslim Brotherhood can play in the Arab countries. Would that mean a declining belief in political, a declining belief in political Islam across the Arab world? I, I think that that's what this poll shows. I, I don't think the forty-three percent number in Egypt means, as as we've just talked about. Uh, I'm you know getting my ID card tomorrow. Um, but I think in the rest of the Arab world, what it looks like is, I'm not comfortable with this. We've seen how it plays out. It doesn't work, and it doesn't work for us. It posed not just an existential threat in Egypt, but I think it did in, in other countries as well. Um, political Islam um, has, has lost its clout. Um, and, uh, and, and even, I mean, what, Unfortunately, I think the way the military has handled it um, is 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 giving them uh, a second win that they they may not deserve. That would be my concern. yeah. And if I may on that as well, I mean, I think uh, if you look at it, sort of like as you know, Karl Rove type type of pollster and so on. I think it's been the case that political Islamist movements have had 15, 20, 25 percent of steady support in, in many Arab societies, whether it's Muslim Brotherhood and Salafists and so on. And I think those core numbers are not changing terribly much, even as you said, 
Uh, you know, sometimes there's a bit more sympathy, a bit less sympathy, but that core is significant. That core will be with us for decades. Now it might transform, it might interact with politics in different ways in different countries. The experiment in Tunisia is different than Egypt, different than Jordan, different than Yemen, different than Kuwait. But one conclusion to my mind is political Islam and organized politics along those lines will be with us, and it's a significant element of life. I think what's partly new is that in the early part of the Arab Spring, since we're talking about that, they had an additional sympathy vote. That while they were the opposition and we're all about now inclusion, we want everybody in because everybody was out, they got an extra 10, 20% at the polls. And there wasn't, at the beginning of the Arab Spring, any fear of the Muslim Brotherhood. There was sympathy, some people weren't with them, but the experience in Egypt, plus the way it was also mediatized and this and that, I think, as Jim says, now there is a very strong secular nationalist, it's not secularist, but secular nationalist, that we are members of a state, this political Islam thing is much scarier than we thought, uh, that is new. Uh, and hence, they no longer have that, I think, easy access to win majorities that they did in 2011 and 2012. Uh, but I think they will be part of politics moving forward, if we have politics. I mean, Tunisia and, has, but others don't. And they also had a competence vote, right? I mean, there were people who said, well, the Brotherhood, you might not like them, but look, the clinics work well, the schools work well, these guys are going to be honest, they're not going to be corrupt, they're going to be able to perform. And the, the incompetence they demonstrated in Egypt, getting rid of the corrupt old officials who at least knew kind of how to do their job, and putting in Muslim Brotherhood hacks, who not only didn't know how to do their job, but didn't have any connections except to the Brotherhood. This credited the Brotherhood's idea of these are guys who can make the place work. And once you lose that, you know, not just the opposition, we want alternation in power, but these guys are even worse than the old bureaucratic hacks that we've been suffering under for a lot of years. I think that has had a profound effect on the Brotherhood's future chances in democratic system. Let's take a question there, and then we'll come back. Thank you. I'm Jerry Thompson. Uh, before we run the Muslim Brotherhood too far down and out here, um, I'm curious about this expansion of support for the Muslim Brotherhood in Saudi Arabia and in Turkey. Uh, you know, the analysis that you propose, as long as you're looking at Egypt, makes lots of sense. But uh, does that also track in Saudi Arabia where you know, the, the Al Saud, at least, are definitely opposed to the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. What does that mean that expand, uh, support for the Muslim Brotherhood is expanding there? And attitude of the government in Turkey towards the Muslim Brotherhood is at best schizophrenic. What's it mean that support for Muslim Brotherhood is expanding there? Well, I can't say it's expanding. Because we don't have it, that's not a, a number we tracked. This is the first time we've asked that question. Um, but it, you're right, it's over 50% in both countries. Um, and I cannot interpret the Saudi number because I just don't, I don't know uh, what it means. Um, certainly it comes before um, the rather intense campaign that Saudis are waging right now. Um, not only against the Brotherhood, uh, which is... The, 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 that campaign has been ongoing for years, but it's it's recently been sort of ratcheted up a couple notches, um, and now the Saudis have gone an extra step, um, and they're uh, campaigning against all kinds of uh, extremist ideologies and lumping a whole bunch of groups under that umbrella, um, and uh, in in effect also uh, challenging some of their own uh, foundational relationships um which i think you know i don't know how that's going to play out in the in the in the years to come but but when we did the poll you're right we got a number 52 percent said it had a positive impact uh, uh in egypt uh we'd never polled it before i don't know if it's rising um turkey i think is different turkey is a a a, a, a ruled by a party that has muslim brotherhood roots or is it in fact a muslim brotherhood uh, party itself, and um, 
has had very strong ties with Egypt. Uh, so it doesn't surprise me that uh, the, the, the Turkish numbers are going to be 52%, which is about Erdogan's numbers anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, so I think that, that, that that's, that's about fair. I mean, Saudi is a very interesting case. If you haven't seen Stefan Lacroix's book called, I think, Islamic Awakenings, it, uh, it documents, like I've never seen anywhere, uh, how the Brotherhood came to Egypt in the 1950s, how the Brotherhood came to Saudi in the 1950s when they were pushed out of Syria um, and Egypt, and how they, they sort of cross-fertilized um, with the Salafi clerical establishment and spun off all sorts of interesting roots. What I think we have come to see um, in the last four years is we, we've often thought of the Brotherhood as a religious movement with sort of a political wing. And I think the Brotherhood's revealed itself to be a political movement with a religious coloration. And in Saudi Arabia, the idea of politics is an existential threat to the existing power structure. And the also would see that and fear it uh, and are trying to, to, to suppress it in all of its forms. And the view when I was talking to people in Saudi Arabia for this book we did last spring was they felt kind of relieved that the brotherhood had been ascended in Egypt because their view is, ah, so all the brothers came out of the woodwork and now we know exactly who they are yeah. and we can target them. But make no mistake that the Saudi political establishment considers the Muslim Brotherhood to be the preeminent political threat that they face. The Emiratis see the Brotherhood, which as far as every poll I've seen in the Emirates has tiny, tiny support, but they see it as an existential threat yeah. because it is profoundly political and not religious in their minds. And, and they have their own notion about how politics should work and the idea of open politics and democratic elections and everything else and delegitimizing the people who are there and say, we are legitimate because we performed and say, no, 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 that's not how it works. That's where the real struggle is. And I think that's why the, the Saudis are as sensitive as they are. And make no mistake, the Saudis are extraordinarily sensitive about the Brotherhood. The Brotherhood is very powerful in the kingdom. Uh, the ideas are very, very popular. And you've had a lot of guys who have retreated from the Twitter sphere. They have been called into the police headquarters. They've been given a talking to and they say, I'm done for now. But that's for now. And they're, they've not gone away. Let me just uh, clarify the numbers for, for just a second. We asked the question, positive, negative role of the brotherhood in the following countries. In Saudi Arabia, 53% said it had a positive impact on Egypt. But when we asked what was the impact of the Brotherhood in your country, uh, Saudi Arabians said only 20% said it had a positive impact in their country. 71% said it had no impact at all. Um, and I, I think that, it, that that was pretty much the norm across the board. The only country where a majority said, or actually anything above 30% said, that it had a positive role in their country was Turkey. Turkey said 53%. Um, and as I said, the Egyptian one was 43%. I'm afraid we have just two minutes left, so no more time for any additional questions. You've each talked about the issue of confidence, whether in institutions or states or policies. So if I can ask you each quickly to give us um, anything in the polls findings that you, um, you find particularly hopeful to close with. Hopeful? Or hopeful. Hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually, I thought that, that look, that, I mean, and, and Paul can answer this better than I can. You know, the Lebanese have been through the ringer on a lot of things. And the Lebanese, I think, came out as being more hopeful about their neighbors pulling out of this stuff, more hopeful than, than a lot of their neighbors on a lot of questions. And it seems to me that, that if there's something to draw from it, it's that the Lebanese who have been through the ringer say, well, you can come out the other side and things can get better. And the Lebanese, as much as they are burdened by the refugees and the extremism and everything else that's coming in, they say, you know what? These countries can pull out because we pulled out. 
I'll go with what he said. Since I'm Lebanese and I share that optimism, I think there is a note of optimism in, I mean, it's much ballyhooed. You know how people have a positive view of what happened in Tunisia. That gives me some hope that they haven't lost track of sort of the long, uh, long term. But uh, yeah, not not terribly much hopeful in the poll itself or in the region. At this yeah, point. I, I think the 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 I'd go with the Tunisia numbers. Um, that it um, it's a model that's working and it's recognized as such, and people uh, people feel strongly strongly about it. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you to the Middle East Institute for partnering with us on this release.